Hello everybody, how are you? I hope you are doing well. Well, today we are going to continue our lecture. Um, uh, the uh, lecture nine, Corpus Approach to Discourse Analysis. Uh, in the previous lecture, we shed light uh, on the following topic. What is a corpus? Kinds of corpora? The Michigan Corpus of Academic Spoken English? The British Academic Spoken English Corpus? the British Academic Written English Corpus, the TOEFL Spoken and Written Academic Language Corpus, Design and Construction of Corpora, Issues to Consider in Construction, uh, in Constructing a Corpus, of course with all its sides, and uh, the Longman Spoken and Written Speech Corpus. And we reach to uh, our topic for today, which is Performance Phenomena of conversational discourse. In this uh, section, we are going to shed light on different uh, topics, silent and filled poses in conversation, utterance uh, launchers uh, and full poses, attention signals in conversation, response uh, elicitors in conversation, non-closal items as response forms, and extended coordination of closes and we are going to explain them one by one because uh, the longman uh, grammar discusses performance phenomena that are characteristic of a uh, conversational discourse speakers need to both plan plan to what they are going to say and at the same time speak as they are doing this meaning and their speech contains uh, poses, hesitations, and repetitions while they are, they are speaking. So let's have a look to them one by one. Uh, silent and full poses in conversation. Why we sometimes keep uh, silent or pose for a while? We, uh, we are doing this because either we are arranging our ideas in their mind to give the uh, to give the suitable uh, expression or the uh, suitable speech, or we are actually uh, avoiding a, a danger of saying something which is unaccepted. So we are trying to find the suitable expression uh, the, the moment uh, in the moment of speech. Of course, it shouldn't uh, the the pause shouldn't be so long. It should be short to uh, not to give indication for the hearer or the listener that we end our speech and now it is your turn to speak. So we have to make it very short and uh, to keep the turn, to keep our turn in, 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 in a speech. So silent and full poses, performance phenomena that are characteristics, a characteristic of conversational discourse include silent and full poses. In the middle of a turn, or a grammatical unit, we use such uh, 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 silent or full poses. In the following example, Marie uses a silent pose to hold on to her turn, uh, turn because she is thinking of saying something and she wants to hold on her turn. As she has not completed the syntactic unit, she is less in danger of losing the turn than if she were to pause at the end of, uh, of the unit. Now, uh, Marie, you are being uh, a 16 year old, wait. Sit down and write down your guest. So this is the pause. Utterance launchers, utterance launchers and full poses. Full poses at transition points in conversational discourse typically use utterance launchers such as well and or sometimes the word right as the speaker prepares in his mind what they are uh, what he is going to say at the beginning of the conversation Ryan uses and as an utterance launcher Ryan and uh, can I have a DJ too is that okay John and Maury both use well as utterance launchers to take follow-up turns 
and full potential poses as they discuss how many people are coming to the party. Let's hear the conversation. Joan, how many people's coming? Marie, well, he wrote the invitations yesterday. Joan, well, how many is he invited? Marie, I don't know. John, well, find out how many is invited. Marie, well, will we need to uh, to uh, will we need to bounce? Up? Sorry, will we need a bouncer? John, well, we'll have to find out how many is coming. Later, Marie uses right as an utter, uh, utterance launcher to uh, both take the turn and also to follow a buzz and to affirm the point she is about to make. Marie, right. So we get out there and we do the twist and the pop and, and the shami shami and whatever, do we? So as you see, how we use the utterance the launcher here. Now, the third one, attention signals in conversation. Speakers often use another person's name just to attract uh, their attention. So it is an attention signal to make it clear who they are speaking to. So let's have this uh, conversation. Mori, John. John, what? Okay, this is what is meant by attention signals. Now, response elic elicitors in conversation. Response elicitors in conversation. There are a number of typical ways of elic eliciting a response in conversational discourse. For example, a question tag can function as a response elicitor as in. Marie. We'll keep, on, we'll keep an orderly party for Saturday night. All, all right. As can a single item, as in the example below. Marie, we had your, your damn party over at the park. We didn't have any, uh, any gay crushers. Diane, party over at the park. How old was I, mom? Eight? Marie? No, six. Now, non-closal items as response forms. Non-closal items such as ah, ah, hmm, yeah, and okay often operate as response forms in conversations. As in, Marie, the DJ? Why would you have to have a DJ? What does he do? Just plays records all night? Ryan? Yeah. Now, extended coordination of clauses. Conversational discourse often includes long extended terms. These terms may be extended by coordination where one closal unit is added to another and then another with items such as and and but, or by the di direct juxtaposition of clauses as in. Let's hear this conversation. Ryan, we'll leave the gate open. We'll leave the pantheon there. And you'll, you'll, you'll see, just see. You, you think I'm so stupid, so, so stupid. But if you, you look around and open your eyes. You will see. This is what is meant by extended coordination. Now, we will move to another topic. This course characteristics of conversational signals. The major aim, of course, in this, we are going to tackle with the uh, many topics. One of them is non 
uh, clausal units in conversational discourse, personal pronouns and ellipses in conversation, situational ellipses in conversation, non-clausal units as elliptic uh, uh, replies in conversa uh, conversation, repetition in conversation, and lexical bundles in conversational discourse. The major aim of the long, uh, long manigrama of spoken and written English, which was uh, derived from the, the Leswe corpus, was to provide a grammar of English based on an analysis of actual language use. The project has also made important observations about discourse characteristics of conversational English. Some of these characteristics are described in these points I've read uh, now, and the data used to illustrate these uh, features is a family argument from a reality television show. The first one, non-closal units in conversational discourse, a key observation made in the long money grammar is that conversational discourse makes wide use of non-closal units, that is, utterances which do not contain an explicit subject or verb. These units are independent, actually, or self-standing, in that they have no grammatical connection with what immediately precedes or follows them. The use of these units in conversation, uh, conversational discourse is very different from uh, written discourse. Actually, in written discourse, they were rarely occur. So conversation, as by Baritel 1999 point out, is highly interactive and often avoids elaboration or specification of meaning. The use of non closal unit is in part a result of this. So I have an extract here I'm going to read and to show you the non-closal units in it. It's uh, between Ryan, Maury, and John. Ryan and... Uh, uh, can I have a DJ too? Is that okay? Maury, John? John, what? Maury, can he have a DJ? A DJ, Ryan. Because you won't be spending much on food, so I thought I John. Well, how much does a DJ cost? Ryan? Yeah, I've got to find out. Mori? Of course, she is speaking to Ryan, the DJ. Why you'd have to have a DJ? What does he do? Just to place a, a records all night? Again, Maury, to Joan. What would you think about the DJ? Is that okay with you? John? I just want to know how much is it first. Maury, speaking to Ryan. Right. That's what you've got to do first, right? Then, Ryan... I'm gonna have to get Paul to come over too. Maury, why? Ryan, so people don't crash the party. Maury, they won't crash the party, sweetheart. You can easily put them off. Ryan, oh yeah, yeah. Maybe 20 years ago, mom, you know. Today, if, if, if uh, there would be easy, Another uh, 40 people, if you didn't have a person at the gate. John, bullshit. I think this is clear. Personal pronouns and ellipses in conversation. Conversational discourse also uh, makes a wide use of personal pronouns and ellipses. This is largely because of the shared context in which conversation occurs. The meaning of these items and what has been left out of the conversation can usually be derived, of course, from the, t uh, the context in which the conversation is taking place. So the same extract 
mentioned previously, um, with the continuous on form, uh, the identity of I, Jude, June and you, Ryan, are clear from the situation in which the people are speaking and cannot be derived from the text alone. So let's hear the extract. June, look, I don't want to be embarrassed, Marie, but don't you think it is a little dramatic saying you've got to have a, a ponsa at a private um, person's party? Ryan? Okay, fine. Later in the conversation, Maury and John are alone. There's an ellipsis in John's reply to Maury as they both know what he is referring to in his reply. There is no need for him to repeat this. Mori, I hope you are going to put that magazine down and give me a bit of hand in a minute. June, you want me to give you a bit of a hand of what? Now, situational ellipses in conversation. Some of what speakers say in conversational discourse is actually predictable and doesn't need to be fully spelled out. Speakers of often use, use uh, situational ellipses in conversation. So they are actually leaving out words of low information value where the meaning of the missing item or items can be derived from the immediate context rather than from elsewhere in the, in the text. For example, John leaves out the subject and the verb in the following utterance when he sums up what he thinks about the number of people that might come to the party. Said John, we've only got room for 30 people here, maximum. So if you've invited 37 and they are all uh, going to bring friends we haven't got enough room, have we? Then he does this again later in the conversation. John, if you want, if you want to have a party here, 40 people is the limit. Simple as that. Now, we move to the non-closal units as elliptic, uh, elliptic uh, replies in conversation. Non-closal units, as elliptic replies, often occur in conversational discourse. As in the example below here that I'm going to read, where Mori simply says, why, why do you have to get Paul to come over? Actually, this is a shared social situation in which the conversation is taking place both uh, between both speakers and both speakers know what she is talking about. So, Ryan says, I'm going to have to get Paul to come over too. Mori, why? So, both actually know who is Paul. That's why she didn't ask who is Paul. Okay, now repetition and conversation. Conversation also uses repetition much more than written discourse. So this, of course, might be done, for example, to, to give added emphasis to a point being made in a conversation. <clears throat> One way speakers may do this is by echoing each other. An example from further in the conversation illustrates this. Maurice's loud repetition of, of Jerry's I don't know why emphasizes the point um, uh, she wants to make. So, Marie, it is more drama living in this house than out of it. Joan, very quietly, I don't know why. Marie, loudly, 
I don't know why. Then later in the conversation, Maria and Joan both make repeated use of parallel structures, which is also typical of conversational discourse. In this case, their use of repeated structures gives emphasis to their disagreement with what Ryan had just said. Joan, no, we are not. No, we are not. Marie, we are living in our home. Joan, we are living in our, in our time, right here and now. Marie, we are living in our home. We are living in our home, Ryan. Joan, we are not living in the past. Okay? So this is what is meant by repetition. Now, lexical bundles in conversational discourse. Lexical, uh, conversational discourse also makes frequent use of lexical bundles. That is, formulaic multi-word sequences, such as it's going to be, if you want to, and or something like that. Research has shown that lexical bundles occur much more frequently in a spoken discourse than they do in written discourse. So speakers may, for example, use them to give themselves time to think what they will say next. They, uh, they, they do this, they do this as as conversation occurs in real time, and speakers often take and hold on to the flow at the same time as they are planning what to say next. Now, Ryan, uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan uses the lexical bundle, I'm just saying, then the utterance uh, launcher will to take and hold on to his turn while he plans what to say to Marie. So, Marie, why do you need a, a ponsa at the gate? Come on, Ryan. I'm just saying, well, um, say I invite uh, three guys. They bring a, a friend along. He is uh, a guy that I, I, I don't like. John gives himself thinking time with all I'm saying is in the following example. June, all I'm saying is, if you've invited, thir invited 37 people and, uh, and uh, they are all going to bring friends, you can't bring friends. Speakers may also use lexical bundles to give the person they are speaking to time to process what they have just said. Ryan does this with his use of, you know, when he says, Ryan, maybe 20 years ago, mom, uh, you know, today, uh, if, if, as does June in, June, I don't want to be embarrassed, uh, you know. So lexical bundles can also function as a discourse organizers in conversation. Ryan uses the lexical bundle. Here we go again to show the conversation has, has gone back to the original topic. So, John, well, if you got any idea that uh, there is gonna be trouble here, um, then we, we don't want trouble. Ryan, oh, here we go again. I didn't. I think now these are all clear. Now we will go to Constructional principles of conversational discourse. The Langman grammar discusses three key principles, three key principles which underlie underlie the production of conversational discourse. The principle of keep talking, keep talking, refers to the need to keep a conversation going while planning for the conversation is going on. So you have to use certain strategies, the strategies that we mentioned, to keep your conversation going on. 
The second principle, limited planning ahead, refers, refers to human memory limitations on a planning ahead, that is, restrictions on the amount of syntactic information that can be stored in memory while the planning is taking place. The third principle, qualification of what has been said, refers to the need to qualify what has been said after the event and to add things which otherwise would have already been said in the conversation. This may be done by the use of digression inserted in the middle of something else or by the use of adds on to what has been said previously. Now, in the following example that I'm, I'm going to mention, a main clause is added to make the first part of a sentence a dependent clause. Ryan, you guys are living in the past, I think. Now, I think this is clear, and let's move to the um, conversational discourse might have also two other things, uh, prefaces in conversation and tags in conversation. So, prefaces in conversation, the main part of a speaker's of a speaker's message is often preceded by a preface which connects what speakers, please pay attention, have to say to the previous utterance as well as giving the speaker time to plan what they will say next. Prefaces may include fronting of a closal units, noun phrase discourse markers, and other expressions, such as interjections, um, response forms, stanza adverbs, linking adverbs, uh, overtures, utterance, launchers, and non-initial use of discourse markers. Now, below is an example of a noun phrase, the object of the, of the sentence used as a preface. Mori, the DJ, why would you have to have a DJ? So she mentioned the DJ uh, uh, initially, before saying anything to attract the listener's attention. So this is the preface. In the next example, Mori uses a single word truly as a preface to orient June to what she is about to say. Mori, truly, it is more drama living in this house than out of it, truly. So she uses truly. The following is an example of a lexical bundle all I'm saying is being used as an overture to uh, profess what Joan wants to say. Joan, all I'm saying is, all I'm saying is, if you've invited 37 people um, and uh, they are all going to bring friends, you can't bring friends. Now, tags in conversation. Speakers add tags in many ways as an after afterthought to a grammatical unit in conversation discourse. Actually, we we do this and they do this. People do this just to uh, to uh, seek agreement to to see whether other peoples are following or not. Uh, they can do this by the use of a question tag at the end of a sentence. The effect of this is to turn a statement into a question. And I believe you know tag a question. Ryan does this in his reply to Joan and Marie. Marie, well, there is not going to be any trouble. John, well, see please the usage of well. Well, Ryan seems to think there is. Ryan, oh yeah. There is gonna be gang warfare. 
in my backyard. Is there a tag can also be added to the end of a statement to reinforce what had just been said. This is can be done or this can be done by repeating a noun phrase or by paraphrasing what has been said or by adding a clausal or non-clausal unit respectively to what had just been said. In the following example, Marie paraphrases now as right this moment. So Marie, you can cut it out now. Right this moment. So conversational discord then has many features which are not typical of more formal kinds of spoken discourse or of course of written discourse because conversation takes place in a shared context and real time. So there is often less specification of meaning than there is in other spoken and, uh, and written journals. Also, because conversations take place between people who usually know each other, it, it'll be less influenced by traditional views of accuracy and correctness that is associated with more publicly available text. The need to keep talking while planning what to say next also has an influence on the nature of conversational discourse. Now, we are going to move to corporate studies of the social nature of discourse. Corporate studies have also considered what the use of the discourse means in wider social terms. Using the me case corpus, Swell's 2003, for example, asks whether the use of spoken language in academic settings can help us understand whether the university is a single community of practice or a set of uh, uh, tribalized, uh, tribalized cot uh, cot uh, coteries of communities of practice. He found academic speaking across the university tended to be informal and conversational, um, guarded rather than evaluative, and differential rather than uh, confrontational. He found the spoken discourse to be unpretentious in terms of vocabulary choice. It also generally avoided name dropping, so there is no name droppings and the use of obscure references. He concludes, as a result of his analysis, that from a language point of view, there are fewer barriers to cross-disciplinary oral communication than there perhaps might be a written academic communication. Because of the convergence of spoken discourse styles, Sweels found, for example, the same use of non-closal units, such as m mm and ah, uh, being used as fillers in spoken academic discourse, as did by Baritel 1999 in their study of conversational discourse. The following example is taken from a research talk. will illustrate this. You remember I mentioned um, that uh, uh, Sir William B. Hardley in 1925 or thereabout uh, 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 did the, an experiment dropping fatty acid in water. This quotation is taken from Swell's 2003. Now we will move to another topic, which is collocation collocation and corpus studies. Corpus studies have also been used to examine collocations in spoken 
and routine discourse. Highland and test 2004. A study, uh, their study of dissertation acknowledgements, for example, they found that collocation of special thanks was the most common way in which dissertation writers expressed gratitude in the acknowledgements section of their dissertations. This was followed by sincere thanks and deep thanks. So they found that uh, by searching their corpus, they discovered this, and they discovered it to see how the writers typically expressed gratitude. And then what items typically occur to the left of the item thanks or to the right of the item thanks. Through their use of language, Highland and Tess 2004 argue dissertation students display their uh, immersion in scholarly networks, their active disciplinary membership, and their observance of the valued academic norms of modesty, gratitude, and appropriate self Offensement, as the example in the previous sections show. The genre of, per, of personal ads, for example, commonly uses linguistic simplification as an economy of language, as an economy of language that is characteristic of other discourse types such as newspaper headlines, academic note-taking, and conversational discourse. The following example has an abbreviated heading, SWF, SWIFT, personal chaining, attractive, young 40, cool, offbeat guy, 30 to 45, and a non-closal unit, secure, and laid back as an add-on, a feature, which is also a characteristic of conversational discourse. So in ads, you might find swift, attractive, young, 40, seeks, cool, offbeat guy, 30 to 45, who likes film, literature, music, outdoors, secure and laid back. Okay, now we move to corpus studies and academic writing. Corpora have been extremely useful for academic writing teachers in that they are able to show how language is used in particular academic journals. Highlands 2002A study of the use of personal pronouns in Hong Kong students' academic writing is an example of this kind, as are his 2008 A and 2008 B analyses of word clusters in published research, uh, research articles and the graduate students' writing. Hers 2010 academic vocabulary in context examines reoccurring patterns of vocabulary in academic text in terms of both frequency and function. Bennett, Lion Fleurdu, 2011A, Leanne Swell, 2006, and Robin, 2010, provide examples of the use of corpus studies in the teaching of academic writing. Flower Due 2011B, drawing on Highline 2009A, describes three main approaches to corpus based discourse analysis that have been used in the study of academic writing. These are textual, critical, and contextual approaches. Textual approaches include Baiba, 
corner and up since 2007, top down and bottom up approaches to corpus based discourse analysis. These sorts of studies focus on, for example, um, language patterns in text, all often, uh, often, although not necessarily, of course, a relation to the discourse structures of text. Uh, while critical approaches aim to draw together insights from critical discourse analysis and the tools of corpus-based analyses, while contextual approaches take situational factors into account using, for example, interviews, data, and other ethnographic techniques to try to gain an insider's view of the words in which the texts are written. Highline's 2002A study of Hong Kong students' academic writing and Harwood's 2005 examination of personal pronouns in, in published research uh, articles are examples of this. Now, there is also, of course, there is also a sample study academic writing and identity. And I'm not going to discuss this because you have to read these uh, 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 samples concerning academic writing and uh, uh, identity and to come close to the writers and try to understand what uh, they intend to say, what, what is their intention, because it is important it is about uh, one page and a half or, or almost, uh, almost two pages. Now we will come to criticism of corpus studies. There have, however, been criticisms of corpus studies. Flower Du 2005 and, and Hanford 2010 provide a summary of and response to some of these criticisms. One criticism is that the computer-based orientation of corpus, of corpus studies is a bottom-up investigation of language use. Uh, a further criticism is that corpora are so large they do not allow for a consideration of contextual aspects of text. Triple 2002 counters this view by uh, providing a detailed discussion of uh, uh, contextual features. Uh, and he uh, put a table, he put a table uh, for the contextual and linguistic framework. And uh, this uh, uh, table includes social context of the text. Uh, actually, it has two columns, uh, horizontal and vertical. In the, in the vertical, uh, there is uh, social context, social context of the text, uh, communicative purpose of the text, roles of readers and writers of the text, and also the shared cultural values required of readers and writers of the text, and knowledge of other texts that can be considered in corpus uh, studies to help address uh, this issue in the in the in the uh, horizontal uh, uh, column there is a contextual analysis uh, there are certain questions in which one can figure out the meaning by following these uh, these questions uh, each of these features he argues can be drawn drawn on to locate the analysis and to give the findings a strong contextual dimension uh, as he argues, understanding language use includes understanding social and contextual knowledge, not just knowledge of the language system. So in his table, he presents the contextual and linguistic components of Tribble's framework. This kind of analysis is especially suited to smaller, specialized corpora, which have a general focus, like, for example, academic essays rather than a register focus, uh, like academic discourse. Triple suggests three stages 
for this kind of analysis. The first one, uh, choose a text which is considered uh, considered uh, an expert example of a particular genre. The second one, compiled contextual information about how the text was created. And the third one, carry out a corpus-assisted analysis of linguistic features of the text that can then be integrated with the contextual analysis. Of course, one way of gaining contextual information for an, al uh, an analysis is by, uh, by the use of the interviews. And with the interviews, we have to focus on group discussions with users of the, of the genre and also with considerations of the textual information revealed in the corpus study in relation to this information. As uh, Highland 2004C did in his uh, uh, disciplinary uh, discourse. The analysis can also be combined with other contextual information available on the data, such as, for example, information on the speech event and the speaker attributes and other information that is available on the data, such as the information that uh, accompanies the uh, me case and, uh, and Bayoui Corpora. Each of these strategies can help offset the argument that corpus studies are necessarily decontextualized and only of interest at the uh, item rather than the uh, discourse uh, level. Now we will reach to the summary of the whole uh, uh, chapter. The, this lecture and the lecture before this have outlined key issues and corpus-based approaches to discourse analysis. It has described different kinds of corpora as well as the role they play in corpus studies. It also uh, give, uh, uh, has given examples of both written and spoken corpora uh, and provided detail of how they can access um, the lectures also have discussed issues in the design and construction of corpora. It, it, uh, have then discussed the Longman grammar of spoken and written English using data uh, for a reality television show to illustrate the observation it makes about conversational discourse. Corpus studies of the social nature of uh, discourse have uh, also been discussed as well as the ways in which the corpus uh, studies have contributed to our understanding of academic uh, writing. Uh, the two lectures, the previous one and this, have concluded with a, a review of criticism, criticisms of corpus studies, as well as suggestions for how these criticisms might be addressed. Here we reach to the end of uh, this lecture. I hope you benefit from both lectures. I hope to see you well. Keep safe. Sit at home. Uh, at home. Uh, thank you very much and goodbye.